Without further ado, I would like to introduce our two presenters today. Um, so the first is Greg Clarkson. Greg founded Network Overdrive in 1999 to help businesses ditch the fax machines for the internet and become 24-7 operations in doing so. Since inception, Network Overdrive has helped hundreds of businesses in their technology journey and in doing so have developed the Profit Stack Framework, a process which allows businesses to only invest in technology projects that drive profits. Joining Greg is Dr. Michael Rowe. Michael is a senior lecturer here at Torrens University. He is also a business consultant, facilitator and coach. He has significant mid and senior ex uh, executive experience in corporate and government and his research interests are focused on improving business performance. So please welcome Greg and Michael. Thank you. Well, hi everybody. Um, let's see how all this works. Are, are you real? I'm real. Okay, that's good. I think I'm real as well. Um, so I've been trying to think about chat GBT and uh, what that could be. The closest I could get to was Carlton Breweries. <laughs> I don't know what the T is, but um, we'll, we'll figure on that. But we're going to be using chat um, GPT um, as an intro into AI in general. But first, um, if you don't mind, I need this group to give me some self-affirmation or some group affirmation because at the moment my kids don't care whether I'm a genius or not and I need you guys somehow to give me some indication that I'm actually on the money because my family doesn't care about that. And the reason why I say that, if you remember for those who are here, in uh, November of last year I came and talked about automation. I said that you know IT does three things for your business one around innovation, one around operational efficiency, and one around protecting what you've got, making sure you don't lose it. And we spent time on automation. And I said 40% spend their time on repetitive tasks. I also said that there's all this stuff around collecting data, processing data, 33% of data of time wasted by humans in business. And I also said that if you want to do it, there's two ways for you to improve your business. You can either do it through um, supplier customer interactions and self-service when you've got the humans. And I also talked about automatic robotic. Went over everybody's head. Um, no one cared. I got ignored. But then, Michael, I believe something called chat GPT came. What do you, do you want to talk about that? Um, I, I do want to talk about it. <laughs> Which is a remarkable coincidence because that's what we're here to talk about. I guess it's fair to say that the internet over the last 20 years has delivered a lot of miracles to us. So it's very easy to get blase about things. I still remember the excitement I felt the first time I looked at um, Google Maps, for example, and was sort of blown away that I could look at any street address anywhere in the world and kind of was what it was like. More recently, I was traveling a month or so back to Japan and I just used Google Translate everywhere. It not only translated what I was looking at, but used the same fonts as the original packaging or whatever used. So it's easy to become a little inured to this stuff and to go, oh, well, it's just another piece of technology. This has been different, though. Um, I will never forget the first time I used this. There's no training required. You ask it a question and it knocks your socks off. And the harder you make the question, the easier it seemed to respond to it. And so, you know, I found that I was spending a lot of time trying to find where are the boundaries to this thing. Like, you know, there's a thing where we, where we uh, move fast and try and break things so that we understand where the limits are. Couldn't really find a limit with this. And I wasn't alone. 100 million people in the first two months went on that journey with me to a greater or lesser extent. So it's the fastest uptake of technology in history. And it's just getting better and it's just getting faster. So, can we have the next? Yeah, I honestly oh. say, like in terms of being cool, I like the fact that it's beat TikTok, because that's what my kids care about. Uh, now I'm more popular than TikTok by riding the ChatGPT bandwagon. Instagram took 30 months to get to the same figure, so these are just significantly different, um, we're different paradigms that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and so we're now making the claim, the title of the invite, that you got bigger than the pandemic, GFC, or the Ukraine war. What do you think about that, Michael? Oh, I think it's absolutely right. I, I kind of equate this. When I'm trying to think of the impact of this, I think, oh, well, what it is is the electric light bulb, 
right? And I'm not quite, Greg probably remembers, he's a bit older than me. I don't remember when the electric light bulb was. <laughs> ah, this is my self-affirmation. Uh, I need from you guys. I don't need that. That's was, what my kids say. <laughs> was, um, that, that one sitting upside down on the chair, see the smart one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and I think there are a lot of parallels with the light globe because, a, a, as you'll see, we can look at the, the, the personal impact with the technology, then we can look at the, the sort of unexpected consequences that translate into business outcomes when it comes to um, the innovation. So with this, we're sort of saying bigger than the pandemic, GFC or Ukraine war, I think it absolutely is, it, no matter how you look at it in terms of social impact, you know, economic impact, the way it's going to change our lives and so on. Um, and we'll get to the AGI thing. You think about a light globe when it, um, before the light globe, I had all these limitations. If I wanted to do something, there were constraints that were put upon me. It has to do it before it gets dark and it's going to be difficult to do it. And uh, how do we, you know, manage all of that? Light globe comes, I'm unshackled. I can do what I want when I want. I can turn darkness into light. It's nice and easy. So from a personal point of view, I can see there's an uplift in productivity and ease and quality of life and so on. What we fail to recognise maybe is that without the light globe, we wouldn't have factories. We wouldn't have office buildings. We wouldn't have just about anything that we equate with modern society. So the unintended consequence of the light globe, the way it enables, as a, as a simple technology, it enables a lot more complex technologies to arise from it. Well, that's what I think we're going to have with this. It's great that you said that because I thought when we wrote this that we were kind of maybe overselling the statement, not to suggest like at all. But then in like Google or um, Alphabet CEO, he said uh, a couple of days ago uh, that it had the power to... Um, be more significant than fire, or as significant as fire and electricity. Yeah. It just goes to your point here. So yeah. these are big topics, big statements, uh, but a lot of people, even those who are afraid of it, are sort of still agreeing with the seismic change. Those who are pro it and those who are afraid of it are sort of all in agreement on this. Now, wait a minute, Greg. Why would anyone be afraid of artificial intelligence? Nothing can go wrong. <laughs> There's nothing wrong here. So but listen, we, um, we we will talk about the fears, and if you're one of those people, there'll be some time, but we've moved that to the end of the presentation. Um, we're going to be primarily the first bit, we're going to be talking about the positives, the ways it can work, to give you a sense of how it's going to be, um, and how it can perhaps um, impact your business. Um, and then depending on the mood of the room and where people, sentiment people want to go, we will talk also about the cons about it. Do you want me to say anything more than that? No, no, that, that's fine. Um, we, we'll move on to the next oh, one. No, we'll go back actually oh. to the AGI thing. Because uh, yes. it's important to note that the chat GPT that we're going to be talking about isn't yet AGI. So it's not um, a general intelligence that will take a question and find a way of answering that question. Although, having said that, I've been listening to, for example, the CEO of OpenAI who developed ChatGPT and the question was asked, is it sentient, you know, is it AGI? And he's going, I don't think so. Which is not really what you want from the CEO who's driving the <laughs> ship that created the, the, the technology. He doesn't know where the technology sits. Um, and there are all sorts of implications that, that, that come from that. Um, but if we, it's currently let's say it's not um, an artificial general intelligence, but we would assume that probably in a few short months or years it would become something that would be indistinguishable from that. One of the issues that we have with this is that something that uh, you know, looks like a duck and sounds like a duck and walks like a duck, it's not necessarily a duck. It could just be imitating a duck to a very, very high standard. And so uh, we've had in the past what's known as the Turing test, which is to try and, um, Alan Turing back post-war said, we'll be in a state of artificial intelligence when having a conversation with a machine is indistinguishable from having a conversation with a human. Well, we reached that point some time ago, but it was done through imitation rather than through natural intelligence. So where this is going, uh, we don't know, but we do know that it's going there very, very, very quickly because we're not training it, it's training it. Um, and I guess just something to keep in the back of your mind, we'll talk about this thing before, but I heard a, a very, very interesting comment, which was that um, whenever a superior intelligence has come into contact with an inferior intelligence, the inferior intelligence has lost. Um, and in this case, you know, we could talk about social media as being the first iteration of chat GPT, of artificial intelligence. We ask a question and answers come back to us. This is the next iteration. This is version 2.0. 
and it's looking like it's a superior intelligence. So draw whatever inference you want from that. But let's make this happy. All let's right. let's move away from the sad stuff. So, so from a tech point of view, so this is why you should pay attention if you're falling asleep. It's big and it's important. If you run a business, your employees will be thinking about this, your customers will be thinking about it. It's important to have the language for you to be able to communicate. So the first three letter acronym for IT, yes, AGI, but you probably thought about AI, it's different. It's AI and then it's AGI. So that's important for you to reflect on and use going forward. And so like we, I alluded to before, we're going to use chat GPT as a way into reflecting on the AI revolution. So there's AI and then there's AGI. General means it, you can, it can respond intelligently to a range of spontaneous questions or inquiries, not, not, not doesn't have hard boundaries around the intelligence. So that's the difference between the two. So uh, what we're going to do next is that we're going to talk about chat GPT as an individual um, how and I think that that's how most people has put your hand up. Who's used ChatGPT so far? Anyone? Everyone. Everyone. Who's the one person? Who, who's the one person who didn't put their hand up? But we won't spotlight them. Um, so we're going to do the individual, which is how most people think of ChatGPT at this point in time. How they can personally use it. If you're a professional knowledge worker, how you can do it for yourself to make yourself more professional. Um, and then we're going to reflect on as a business or as an organisation, how can you do that? So, the first word we said AGI. The next word is prompting. We're going to learn this word. What does prompting mean? Go for it, Michael. So. Prompting is the user input, as you know, if you've used it, you know how important that user input is. And so basically the, the sort of central deceit to chat GPT is it looks at the structure of words that you've put into the prompt, uh, what those words are, what order they come in, and from that it suggests what the first word of its response should be. And then it takes those things together and then generates a second word, a third word, and so on. And before you know it, it's writing poems about box, box girder bridges. But it does mean that the prompt that you use is critically important. Um, if you ask it the same thing on different days, it can give you different answers because the back end is constantly developing itself. So just as a little as, bit like a human. Little bit like it, well, it, that's what it is. It's growing up in front of our eyes. Um, and so, but also, you know, there's, we could argue that there's no such thing as an objective truth because everything that we see we analyse and interpret in our brains and depending on how we feel or what mood we're in, something could be good one day and exactly the same thing could be annoying the next day and so it is with this in that if you ask it different questions, it can come at those questions from different answers and give you different information back. So the prompt starts to become the really interesting thing and so we're starting to see people call themselves prompt engineers coming into the market in order to get the results that you're actually looking for rather than the results that you would otherwise get. The important thing as you know, know, obviously, the difference between this and something like a Google is that it remembers what, you, what it told you and then you can ask it to go back and selectively change parts of that or to revise it completely or whatever. So it becomes iterative and that starts to feel a little bit like a conversation. Um, there are some academics that have been uh, using this since day one that publish just about every day um, the outcome of their experiments. And the degree to which this can be responsive and interactive is really stunning. And the sort of things that it can do, one of the, we'll, we'll do five or six things for you today, but one of the things that we, we won't do but is really appealing to me as an academic, um, as we go through a trimester, I want to know that my students are learning progressively as we go along. Um, if we have written reports, which we do for our assessments, then there's the sort of the, the understanding of the subject content, but then there's also the ability to write a 3,000 word assignment about that. And sometimes the student might understand, but might not yet have the skills to write convincingly. So the solution for me is to say, well, look, multiple choice questions. It'd be great if we had you know, five or 10 multiple choice questions every week that tested the depth of their understanding of these concepts that we're teaching them. I can't do that, that takes too much time and it's just exhausting and it's a terrible thing to do. Like it's a, literally against the Geneva Convention to write 10 multiple choice questions every week on a particular subject. I checked, I checked. But ChatGPT does that. You can put a prompt in that, that where it will ask you uh, what's the topic and you tell it. It generates multiple choice questions plus the answer key plus the rationale for the answer key. And it can do that on command at will anytime you want it on any subject. 
So, you know, as an ac academic, I look at it and go, hey, I like the sound of these prompt things. If it can do that, what else can it do? Let me interrupt with, um, I think as a metaphor, think of it as, um, so this is, uh, I'm assuming it's just AI and not AGI. So it's not thinking when you're not, like when you're not interacting with it, it's shut down, it's silent. Um, it's like water or some oil or some sound drum. It's still and it's just waiting. The prompt is you tapping it and all of a sudden you see the waves reverberate around it. If you tap it in different ways, you get different patterns. But it's still until you, get the, until you initiate the reaction and your reaction that initiates it is part of the feedback loop that creates the patterns from thereafter as you go through and ask it different things and you interact with it. And then the idea is, is that when you've done with that and you, like with a, one of those magnetic boards, you, you wipe the slate clean and you come back, it's completely fresh. And then you can tap it again and you get a different response. So the prompt, the words matter, um, including the, the next, the word, it, when it offers you a word, that gets fed into it. That's what Michael said. That's a really important part of what we're going to explore in a second about being a prompt engineer is understanding this this type of way of interacting, which is different to how you would normally interact with a computer or Google as an example, archetype computer example. So now there's another word, steerability. What does that mean? You want to say something about that? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go. That's pretty steerable. Right, so well, I'll keep going. So, so with prompt engineering, because the fact that the way you put the words together, the strings, the context, you can actually steer ChatGPT in a direction to give you an output that you want. So, it, um, and so that might be, um, when we get to corporate behavior, that might be concerning because you might want to put limits around where it goes, the type of responses that come back. The human that's interacting with it can steer it into what they want. And we're going to talk about some techniques in a second about how you can set up your prompt to get the, the, the chat GPT to respond in a certain way. And that whole behavior of interacting with it is called, uh, it's, it's utilizing the feature of steerability in the system. So I guess what you're saying also, therefore, it might have some ethical guidelines built into it by the programmers, which is around, you know, don't say anything controversial, but it doesn't have an inherent sense of morality about right or wrong and what's appropriate or inappropriate. And the person guiding it can therefore potentially take it in directions that it shouldn't go in. Okay, so gone on who you might have everyone doing. We just wanted to quickly frame up at this point. Now we're going to do a demo. All right, so what we're going to do now is do some prompts and actually show you some interactions and hopefully teach you a few things um, if you haven't done it. And to, for this purpose, I'm going to get Mark come up the room. You're going to come here? Come on. So Mark, um, I just wanted to, has... Um, decided to come along. He doesn't know anyone here except me and maybe his dad, but we won't go into that. <laughs> um, and uh, like, so tell me about what's your official role? Like, what title would you give yourself? Uh, so I'm a, I'm a video marketer ma mainly, I guess. Uh, okay. I do a lot of copywriting and um, developing concepts for, yeah, video content. And so, what percentage, what, like, what have you actually done in the last two weeks? The last two weeks, I've spent about 98% of my time on ChatGPT. What? So, yeah, yeah. Pretty much, I was doing a lot of, you know, developing concepts and pitch documents for, you know, different companies. Primarily, I've been working with Mazda. And um, then once I realized that I could use ChatGPT in a professional setting as well as, you know, my personal setting and that, you know, I was allowed to do that. <laughs> well, I wasn't cheating. Um, I brought that in and... I can okay. get the work done in a week that, you know, uh, they, you know, I now do it in a day. And uh, so although your official title is, um, you know, creative video person, mm. uh, I'm hearing that you might actually, let's just go back a bit, prompt engineering. Like how much is that yeah. meaningful for you? Uh, I mean, in the last couple of weeks, I've become a prompt engineer. That's it. Yeah, right. that's what I do now. So it could actually be his job title. And so for you guys, most of you are probably going to be hiring a, a prompt engineer in your business in the near future. And if you don't have the official title, it's actually what your staff are going to be doing, is prompt engineering. So that's what we're going to do. So Mark's going to help me perhaps, we'll see how far, um, at, at least at some point about the, the thing. Which shall we do? Okay, but we'll go back to this. So um, first one, so we've got ChatGPT, 
And uh, I don't know if you heard, but Microsoft invested $10 billion into um, OpenAI. And what they get in return as part of that is that they've released their own suite of products. So you can interact with um, ChatGPT through the Microsoft ecosystem. Best $10 billion I reckon they've spent. And um, so the first cab off the rank was in Edge, in Bing, search, you can do Bing Chat. Who's used Bing Chat? Anyone? A few people, not so many, right. So the reason why you would use Bing Chat as opposed to OpenAI ChatGPT is that you get ChatGPT4 as part of Bing Chat for free. Whereas if you have ChatGPT, you're still on 3.5 and you'll see a difference in the responses. Uh, frankly, it's less fun if you're going to use the Microsoft version. But let's see how we go here. So I've got to toggle between the two and put my glasses on and then we'll come back to this. Um, so can you see this? All right. So you might have saw it in a power slide. We're going to just walk through a couple of prompts. So the first one is uh, someone applying for a job. If you, in your um, Bing, search go to seek, find a job, for some reason I want to do social policy um, for the federal government. And um, so let me, just, let me just go. You can, on the right-hand side, you can bring up this bar here. See that little B icon? Can you see that mouse hovering over there? And so here's the first prompt. Um, you will ask me interview questions for the position detailed on this page. I am a candidate for this job. I want you to only reply as the interviewer. Do not write all the conversation at once. Ask me the questions and wait for my response. Do not write explanations. Ask me the questions one by one and wait for my answer. So that's the prompt. So now, hello, I'm happy to help you with your interview. Can you please tell me which position you're applying for? So I stuffed up. I didn't, I didn't know what they were talking about. So I'm sorry, I don't know what position you're asking for. So then I finally said, I'm applying for the role of social division. This is where I might need your help to scroll down if you can. And, 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 and you, go, you go, great, here's the first question. Oh, sorry, I'm applying for, so that was me. Here's the first question. Can you tell me about your experience working with social policy? Bang. And now I'm practicing my interview with ChatGPT to apply for a job. You can do the same thing in reverse as an interviewer, as an employee. You can have your job description, you can ask, you can upload a CV and say, write why I'm excellent for this position. Here's my CV. It will summarise it for you. There's your cover letter to tell you to go. Right? So that's ChatGPT. That's how it can work because it works with a web page. You go to a web page, you bring up ChatGPT, you can interact with ChatGPT, sorry, Bing Chat with the website in there. So um, we'll just need to go to the next one. So, so that's sort of like a serious chat GPT. The next one is it's more of a fun thing. I'll go up to the top of that. And can you close off the um, Bing chat on the right hand side? Yeah, hit that. You, did you know that you can make chat GPT your time travel guide? You can go anywhere and pretend. This is now fantasy, but I'll teach you an important truth. I want you to act as my time travel guide. I'll provide you with the historical period uh, of, that I want to visit and you will suggest the best events. Do not write explanations. Simply provide interesting suggestions and stay in character. My first request is I want to visit the Viking period in Britain. Right? And then ChatGPT responds, Ahoy! Welcome to the Viking Age in Britain! Right? And it says, give me my ten things. A ten a thing? I didn't know a thing was a thing. But um, visit Jorvik. Jorvik? Ah, that's York, right? Enjoy your travels at the bottom. Okay, so principle number one. So the first one is I was just talking about it can interact. Uh, did you notice how I said I want you to act like an, in, an interviewer? This one, I want to, sorry, can you scroll up to the top? I want you to act like a time travel guide. So this idea of impersonation, of playfulness, is a great way to implement steerability. With, with the AI systems and to get amazingly creative, interesting responses. Does people get that? So that's the first, well, you're now on your way to becoming a prompt engineer. If you understand how to make it act, how to impersonate it and so on. Can you go to the fourth word in the sentence one? We might as well just jump from there and just go to the top. Okay, so what we're gonna learn now is, is that if, if ChatGPT is wrong, 
you can teach it in the prompt. The things that is most likely to be wrong is logic and formulas. That's the, where it's weakest. So, what is the fourth word in the phrase, I am not what I am? So, so actually being chat gets that correct. Um, chat GPT 3.5 gets it wrong. The fourth word in the phrase, I am not what I am, is not. Is that the fourth word? No, right. So that gives you an idea of how an AI system gets it wrong. Then I say, what's the, I repeat, what is the fourth word in the phrase, I am not what I am? Let's think step by step. This is the next trick for prompt engineering. Let's think step by step. Sure, let's break it down. First word is I, second word is am, not what. The fourth word is what. It could, when I instruct ChatGPT to behave in a certain way, it gets the answer. So you have to provide that. So this is the next tool. Do you want to say anything about that? Oh, just it's interesting you bring that um, because one of the recurring themes then what I've been seeing is that um, these AI things find the stuff that we find hard, they find easy. The stuff that we find really easy, they find extremely difficult. And that's the case in point. It's a good rule of thumb to keep in your mind. The harder you make the problem, the more easy it is for it to solve. Um, can you jump, Mark, to... Um Original tech businessman. So that's another one that you can do. And again, it's an idea of um, cumulatively building your interaction with ChatGPT. Um, I wanted to start a business that is the intersection of business and technology. I asked it to give me 10 names for the business. So it's given me TechBridge, SynapseWorks, CodeFusion, so on. Well, perhaps okay. I don't know. What do you think, uh, Peter? Business names? Oh, crap, right. But so here's, so here's one interesting trick. Now use the uh, Igor naming guide. I didn't even know that was a thing. Has anyone heard of the Igor naming guide? Well, um, <laughs> let's find out. To come up with better names and tell me why they're better. Sure, here's 10 potential business names on the intersection of business technology using the Igor naming guide principles. Convergent IQ. This name's the plane that gives you the blah, blah, blah. So it's using emotion and impactfulness, and that's the Igor naming. So I can give it a paradigm, and then it will use that paradigm to give me uh, 10 different business names, which may or not be better. I actually registered the first for the hell of it. But, um, <laughs> so if you ever go to Conversion IQ, that's me. <laughs> um, so, so what are we here? So again, again, I've given you the idea that the prompts you build upon each other, and you can, you can give it concepts or a body of literature to say, okay, no, 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 not this great, and it, I didn't have to explain, did you say, um, can, I said, now use, right? I didn't say, I didn't have to repeat myself, right? I just said, okay, thanks for that, that's nice, now use this and, now, and give me something better. Um, and then it gave me something better, perhaps, all right? So that's the second point um, that we wanted to do, which is the original tech business one. Now, and I've done the fourth, I've done the Viking. All right, I think I might be flipping over to you, Mark. Do you want to do some of your image stuff? Yeah. So I've created a lot of pitch docs and um, I've done a couple of pitch docs for TV and things like that. And I've found the best way to get the most specific results is using, of course, AI, the text to image model. So this is an example of a prompt that I've used in Mid Journey, um, which. So Midjourney is a text to image AI um, uh, model, which essentially, you know, you input a prompt and then it spits out four different images, 30 seconds, um, which is amazing. And it gives you, you know, lots of options and things like that. But of course, to get what you want, you've got to really be very specific. So here I've said this was for a security company. And I've said, imagine a male and female security guard, so imagine is the prompt that you have to use in mid-journey, uh, watching over a city. Split screen, subtle and powerful, 50 millimeter lens, 0 0.7 side profile, so I'm seeing a certain portion of the face. Teal and orange color scheme, city view from a height, 4K, photorealistic, low chaos, which these are specific prompts that you use in mid-journey. Um, these all have to do with how uh, the AI will develop the image uh, so it's, I guess, more realistic rather than, you know, absurd because it can create some truly absurd things. Um, yeah, so low chaos just means that I want it to feel natural, realistic. 
And this section here where it says IW6, this has to do with the weight of the image, so what I want. So I've said man and the woman, um, I want that to be a weight of 6 out of 10, which means they're going to be my primary subjects in there. Um, and if you go, you go to the next, that's the <laughs> Yeah, so this is my, you know, in the uh, pitch deck, this was my opening slide. I created um, pretty much everything in the pitch deck uh, was made by AI, including all the text, all the copy. And then when I created the storyboard, I went over to another um, AI program called DALI um, and said, you know, instead of me sketching up my storyboard for what's going to be uh, shot on camera, said, you know, make this these are my shots, make this into a storyboard, and it does it for me in a hand-sketched sort of manner. Um, so, so that's the end of the stock photography industry then? Yeah, yeah, it's done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, yeah. <laughs> and I'm moving on instead of Mazda one. Yeah, so uh, as I said, I've done work for Mazda uh, before, and uh, this can is... Can you, again, I want you to act as, that's the key. You see that at the very first part of the top? Keep going. Yeah, so... Um, giving, giving it the role is the first thing that I've done. This is, um, this is specifically, I've been using ChatGPT uh, 3.5 for this. Um, so I really I treat it like a child in a lot of ways, like the smartest child I've ever known. Um, but here I'm saying, I want you to act as, act as an expert social media copywriter. You are an expert social media copywriter on topics relating to car sales and Mazda vehicles. You are creating a long list of varied social media captions for Brighton Mazda's social media about the CX-90 release. These captions are directed to potential customers. Follow my instructions. Follow them very carefully. Do not deviate from my instructions. So then here I do what Greg uh, was saying before, provide a step-by-step -step reasoning of why you're making the decisions you're making. Um, write engaging professional social media cap captions. Um, give it an audience, give it, you know, these caveats of how long they should be, including call to action, what that, what an example of that is. Then I give it a tone. Um, a good example would be Brighton Mazda. I uh, then down underneath, what I do is I provide further uh, context. So I give it the information on this car, the CX-90. Then I give it the information of, you know, these are examples of some uh, Mazda Australia copy. And... Uh, oh, sorry, fast, oh, no, no, that's sorry, fine. The yeah, and then these are the responses it spits out. You know, introducing the first ever C Mazda CX-90. Thoughtful conveniences and exceptional performance have been finally crafted to create an elevated experience for you and your family. Now available for pre-order, Mazda CX-90, family car. And it gives you all these different varying options, and if I don't like them, I just click regenerate response, and then in a matter of 15 minutes, I've got 60 captions that people can chuck on their social media. Um, and easy as that. So, yes. So that's the end of the copywriting industry, right? Yeah. 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 So. Yes, it's done. There's a whole engineering there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> and. Uh, yeah. So, I'll just click over to chat GPT. Um, so, like, you, definitely, uh, you still need the expert to know what you want and to have an eye in composition. But you still get further help. So going into ChatGPT, this is not the end game. But you can start with, I know nothing about how to take a good photo. So key elements of a best family portrait. And then you can get the ChatGPT to give you, oh, you need contrast, you need natural setting, you need creative framing, you need lighting, and so on. So it's telling me what makes a good composition according to whatever. And then I can say, use it down, make a table with examples. So then it can break them out into type of portrait, contrast expressions, natural setting. So you've got this as a brief that you can take your photographer to, 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 or to take your, your painting. But then, um, which I haven't done, you can convert this and I'll give, give me, the, I really like start the part, portrait, the shadow, the beauty, actually pushing kids on the swing. This is me trying to come up with that first picture where I've had my kids looking bored, if you haven't figured it out. Um, Dad and Susie actually pushing kids on the swing so they look disinterested. I really like that idea, I want to get that photo. Um, trees, you've got the trunk, blah, blah, blah. You can take that, because that's what I want. You can say, now give me a mid-journey prompt. That will give me this image. So it will generate all that technical mumbo-jumbo that uh, Mark showed you, and you can put that into another AI system, which is an image-specific one, to create that. So this is how you can start to link certain AI systems together to produce a workflow for a prompt engineer. That, but yet you still need intelligent people, right, like, to be able to do all this. 
and creative people, etc. Did you want to say anything else, Mark, on your bits to say? Um, uh, I guess the only thing, sorry, uh, what you said is it, it's quite general, um, which I've found as well. And a lot of the time, that first response that I'll get is not the result that I'm looking for. Um, really, the big thing I found with ChatGPT, at least this 3.5 version, is doing, the, doing those recursions, doing another thing and saying, OK, well, this is what's missing from this. I change one or two things, give it one different bit of information, and then you know, out of those 10, let's say, you know, for example, these are the social media captions, out of those 10 results, I might get three of them that are really good. And then you know, over time, because it only takes the click of a button and a couple of words change, as long as you're specific, it adds up to something pretty, you know, pretty amazing. So yeah, but I guess that's all. Great. So I'm going to take that mic off of you. Um, so Michael, you're about to uh, come yeah, back sure. on in. Okay. I just want to say one final thing before you get yeah, yeah. going. Is, so I hope you get the idea that um, if you, those, all those people that put their hand up saying you use ChatGPT, if you've just put in one question, and you, went, and you went, look at this response, isn't this amazing? You missed the point. You've missed the point. You have to go, okay, no, that's not good enough. I'll now want you to do it this way. I'll now want you to pretend to be that way. I want you to pretend, you know, you've got to play with the system to get the results that you want. Um, hopefully that's the main take over for that. And, you know, there's another thing from the personal point of view is, is that um, we've, we've got very detailed ways of going about doing the things that we do. And, and so, um, prior to the computer, if anybody wanted to write something, then they would pick up a pen and a piece of paper. It took a long time for us to lose the habit of picking up a pen and a piece of paper. So we've got these deeply entrenched behaviours which are getting in the way of us really embracing this stuff and using it as a tool to help us be more efficient and to increase the quality of our work and all that sort of stuff. So I'd encourage everybody here from the personal point of view is to have it close by on their laptop or have it as part of their thinking of when you start writing something saying, well, do I really need to write this? You know, if it's something that's mission critical or reflects you as a person, absolutely. But the vast bulk of what we produce in terms of verbiage is commodity verbiage. It's we're asking for something. We're not, you know, we're not expressing ourselves. We're trying to get an outcome. If we can do it so much faster with this, then, you know, if we don't, Everybody else out there is, and the risk is that we, we fall back just because we're not moving forward. So that was thinking about us as the personal usage case. Now we think about the business usage case, and this is where it becomes you know, really interesting. Can we move forward? Um, so we're gonna, Greg and I are going to have a conversation, okay. because Greg knows a lot more about the application of this than most people. And we had a conversation recently, Greg, and that really expanded my thinking as well. Actually, why don't we, we move it forward? Far? There, we're far away. Come forward. So, so if you think about um, the corporate usage of of this sort of technology, um, like where do you see it potentially being applied? Like, what does it look like? I mean, I understand like how it works for me, but what does it look like in a corporate sense? Oh well, you might see in the slide where I talk about a corporate brain. I think that's not a bad way to go. There might be other ways to express it. Um, Microsoft is moving into this space a lot, so is other vendors. So the problem is, um, if I've, um, every company has spent a lot of time creating procedures, oh s documents, um, some sort of policy about X, Y, and Z, um, IT security policies, and, and, and everyone's sneaking fear is that they're dead as soon as they get published. No one reads them, no one looks at them. They're not interactive. And the, what's worse is, is that they're actually... Um, um, contradictory because they get edited over time, different managers may have come and gone and they're not there. So what ChatGPT offers and AI systems is that it can, um, it can index all that information and so when I say, when I ask the question, what do I need to do to be able to work from home on Thursday, it will collect, give me immediately an answer that covers all that information. So it will tell me, um, you know, that's you need... specific to your organisation? That's specific to your... Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But yes, it needs to be your information. So you, it needs to be your corporate data that's, um, that is that is fed to your employees or your customers about how you do business. Uh, that's the holy grail. That, that is the most obvious way that this is going to transform a business is all that corporate information that is internally contradictory, mm -hmm. illogical, 
you, depending on how you read the, the stuff, it will do a better job of making sense of that than um, whoever else. So what about financial reports and things like that? Uh, well, again, um, now that's the big scary one, but it, can, um, it will be able to look at the way an Excel spreadsheet is formed. Multi and the point is it, look, it can look at multiple. So let's say over history you've created 15 Excel spreadsheets over some sort of profit and loss performance, um, and you're wanting to do some prediction for the future. It will be able to synthesize all of them um, for that business and give you some insight. And if you've seen any, and it will actually, you can even ask it to create a graph, a pivot table, um, and some sort of um, summary report, and you can tell it to, you know, and then you can copy and put that into Word, and you can tell Word to format it using the Excel spreadsheet. So um, it allows, again, you've got to know all these principles about how to, like, it's one thing for it to index all your information, but the uh, power is in the art of the question. Um, and when you are able to ask it and give it the context, it will, it will work really well. So all the other, sorry, uh, here that, so all, everything I've just said, there'll be, for those, if you're, if you're listening to me and haven't, you know, gone off on your own chat GPT journey, um, <laughs> um, you'll, you'll be thinking, ah, yes, but, ah, yes, but, there's every single thing I've said, I'll, there should be alarm bells, uh, th th but there are answers for all those concerns. So what oh, about sorry, the, wait, 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 wait. I was just going to ask, so we saw earlier how, you know, you asked it for the fourth word in a sentence, for example, and it gave you the, the wrong one. When you put that data through it, is there a way to test, I guess, how accurate? Mm, great it, question. Can you put it through a few times or um, to check that it is really giving you the true yeah, so there's the problem of hallucination, where if it doesn't know the correct answer, it will convincingly argue the wrong answer, and so you need to have some awareness about that. How do we deal with that? Yeah, so there's governance, really governance. So, um, again, for business settings, um, those who want to sell into business, like Microsoft, like other uh, companies, they talk about it. But, um, you know, what I'd be interested in doing, when I talk to business, they go, there's no way I'm going to get into this, until I say to them, uh, what about if we were able to give you a portal or some that under your control, your data never leaves your business, your data never gets trained, like it's not used for training, so there's no leakage problems to go out into the internet for IP. Um, and that, but if an employee asks you a question for the first time ever, like, I think I've just been sexually harassed, what do I do? Um, if that's the first time that type of question has been asked, um, your HR manager knows about it, that that type of question's been asked by someone in the business, and you can escalate that question to a human as opposed to getting an automatic chat. But if you've answered the question of what do I do for leave on a Thursday, uh, it's automated. Yeah. So I think this um, intervention of, of whatever, so the business has control of who answers the questions is once, if, that, if a business is assured that that happens, they're all over it. So if you've got all of your documentation on a shared drive with, as most businesses would have, with, you know, all of their HR stuff and their accounting stuff, their operations manual, all that sort of thing, you can train the AI on that information, that information alone, and it will be able to make inferences based on that training. Is that what we're talking about? We're going to see that by Christmas. That okay. will be there for Christmas. Yeah. Well, where's the, where, where's yeah. the data? Well, I, I think that's yeah. the best thing. The problem with, I think, the chat GPT, though, is I guess it's just another sort of AI tool, right? Yeah. I think sometimes we forget around what tool we use for what purpose. We're, we're, right? but, so this yeah. is a language, you know, um, a language sort of um, AI sort of implementation algorithm yep. as yep. opposed to some of the broader. And you're right, chat GPT, by definition, cannot do the linking. Because that's not what yeah, it's, it's, it's other models that do that very, very well. Mm -hmm. It's not. But, but we'd also... I think understanding that is, is important. 
yeah, sure. But, but a tool doesn't usually teach itself, so there's the machine learning aspect of it. But there's the other thing that, because we confronted this in the university, and we're still confronting it, but in the early days, we kind of went through the five stages of grief all in, the, in about a month. And, and when we were in the denial phase, people were sort of going, oh, well, you know, we can always tell what was written by a computer. And then pretty soon after, it's, oh, shit, we can't because it's indistinguishable. And this is still in the infant stage. And so I agree with everything you're saying now. But to your point, probably by the end of the year, I mean, it is growing so fast and it's making new neural connections so quickly that you would, you know, it's pretty hard not to imagine it being a very good simulator of perfect wisdom and knowledge and error free in a relatively short period of time. Corporate data, it will do a good job. With conscious of time, so wanting to keep moving, if that's all right. We've got more time for more questions. I just want to talk about the Louis thing. Quickly. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so um, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. So back, I talked about self-service, so customer self-service. Again, you've got risks around doing the wrong thing, but it's going to be a game changer. Um, so what, uh, one person said to me, we're all used to the GUI we all, and um, graphical user interface, and we're now about to enter the LUI, so language user interface. So you'll be able to interact with your IT systems through language, um, and that's going to be a massive change um, from the GUI is not going to be so important. And um, we talk about the rise of prompt engineers as a service, um, and obviously um, it's important. I just think even if you're not ready, it's important to start talking to your staff about it. That's the whole reason why OpenAI happened, by the way. They made a decision, like Google, um, Amazon, a whole bunch of other AI companies are keeping it quiet and they're only releasing it to the big Fortune 500 companies that they do it because they don't, they don't feel it's ready yet. So they want to release onto the world some absolutely 100 time fold amazing AI system in two years' time. OpenAI chose to go a different route, which is release early with faults, so that we as business owners here in Victoria can think about it now with our staff rather than getting hit by a tsunami in three or five years. I applaud OpenAI for that decision. Google, uh, sorry, uh, Facebook tried to do that uh, six months ago. Has anyone ever heard of Galactica? It's exactly like ChatGPT, released by Meta. It, had, it gave a response back to people of, uh, explain to me the health benefits of eating broken glass. And it gave a fantastic, very convincing argument why everyone should be eating broken glass. <laughs> and, um, and that system only lasted three days. It was taken down by outrage. And so in the context of that, OpenAI is still released. Um, but they had enough guardrails that those sorts of gross um, information never made it into the interface. So uh, your employees will be thinking about this as well. Shall we move on to yeah. The questions? Yeah. What we're do. Uh, so we're questions here? No, no. So there. what we want to do, right, is we're now going we're moving into a break time and then we're going to have a workshop time. As a part of it, how do we put this across the Mentimeter? So these are the questions. Oh, yeah. And then I'll get to it. So you'll see, chat, you'll see Mentimeter in a second come up. But there's three areas of your business. Now we've sort of shown you a few demos. We've had a bit of a chat. Where do you think... ChatGPT and its like could impact your business. If you could put that into the Mentimeter uh, thing. And um, uh, oh, how do I go? Hang on, I've got to go. Okay, so can you, can you control that? What do I, how do I go to the next one? Oh, it's not showing. I've got to kill the PowerPoint. Sorry, yeah, next slide. Yeah. Okay, so let me just kill that. So we'll get you to think up these three areas, and then what we're going to yep. do after the break is we'll sort you into tables of approximately eight people. There'll be one of us on each of your tables as well. And we'll work through usage cases, and we'll start thinking about prompts and so on. So Great. hopefully you can walk out of here today with a real head start when it comes to getting some commercial advantage out of using it. Are we really just going to talk about research and legal? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Advice, reporting. Not wanting to influence the group, but no one's talking sales. Um, no one's interested in finance. Is finance there anywhere? All right, marketing, thank you, whoever wrote that. Content branding, content. branding's okay. Oh, oh marketing, no. All right, how we've, have we all basically done it? All right, so. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that, so language, language example. So offshoring, um, just quality of people's emails. Okay, so yeah. Um, so Michael spoke earlier about developing um, tests like um, uh, what is it called? The Turing test. No, no, the um, oh, uh, multiple, multiple, multiple choice yes. questions as a teacher. Yeah. But how do you stop, or how do you, what do you do if your students submit? 3,000 word essays that oh, generated by chat. Welcome to my world. <laughs> That's exactly my, my world. Do you well. mind answering that question after the break? Uh, sure. Just hold it on for a second. Um, we Build are, the suspense so a little bit. What, what, what we're going to do, well, what, I've been told to keep to the time. Oh, shit. Okay. Um, you, you're so, doing okay, bro. You're doing okay. Are we really? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, then. Well, then. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, answer the question. Oh, okay. So, how do we. <laughs> So we, this, this is the thing. So the universities, the, the, the knee-jerk response was to say, how do we ban ChatGPT, which is like saying, how do we ban the electric light? Yeah. A, you can't do it. B, you shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes, how do we use it in our assessments? And there are some, um, some visionaries, I'd say, that now make uh, ChatGPT compulsory in all of their assessments. Mm -hmm. So they say, use it, show me the first output, and then show me how you've improved it yourself. Um, my experience with students is that uh, so far only the bad ones do it and then it's blindingly obvious that they've done it because they're not smart enough to disguise it in any way. Even if they disguise it in some way, um, it's very good at giving a generic response but not the kind of detailed nuanced response we expect from postgraduate students. So I was concerned. I thought this is going to be a nightmare. It hasn't been a nightmare. But it's interesting because this is, comes back to mindset again, is we're looking at how do we create, how do we create. But to your point, we can also use ChatGPT to mark these papers. And one of these academics did that. He got one AI bot from one company to write, an assess, write a paper in response to an assessment brief. And then he got another bot from another company to grade it. And, and so I'm looking at it going, I'm in the middle of marking hell right now, which is another thing that should be against the bloody Geneva Convention, because having to mark all of these papers is time consuming, inefficient, it's not the best use of me as a resource. Creating various levels of shite. Yes, ab absolutely, and it's decreasing my lifespan and my happiness. But it, so if I can feed it the rubric and then just give it paper after paper, and shite, it, can, shite, shite. It, can write, it can write the thinly disguised passive aggressive comments. <laughs> that one hopes that the students aren't quite picking up on, yeah. um, then that would be, then the world would be a better place for everybody. So swings and roundabouts, but it, it hasn't, like this is one of those things that, that we, that, you know, we don't really have a choice to embrace it. We embrace it now or, you know, it becomes embraced for us by people that we don't like or we're in competition with. So this is really how do we turn, sure there's a threat component to it, but how do we maximise the opportunity setting on it? And that, that to me is tremendously exciting. Sorry, just what I, now I look at it, electric light, yeah, there's that, but I look at it as a text substrate maker. So it'll give me 2,000 words and I just have to make sure that they look pretty. But I don't, it dis, 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 disconnects the mechanical act of writing with the act of having thoughtful, interesting narratives. So it can write something that's 80% and then I put the 20% humanity in and everybody's happy. Okay, sorry.
All right, so thanks for that. It's super short to be able to do that in 20 minutes. As you can see, you probably spend a day doing this sort of work and just talking about prompts to get the maximum bit about it. So what we're going to do now is hopefully someone is able to share. You, I'd like to well, just start with number one and then number two and so on. And if you can just stand up, introduce yourself, your name, and and what not. I don't want you to go through everything. If you just cut to the prompt. If there's a story behind the prompt, but really we've only got a few minutes for each table. And what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to um, write. I'm going to turn off. Sorry, I'm going to write up the prompt. You won't see it yet. I'll be and that, that will come up here. So we've got table one, table two, table three prompt. And then we'll just see what it is, and we'll reflect on that afterwards. Okay. Sure. So t table number one. Who's being nominated? Stand up if you don't mind. We all see you. Right. Okay. Okay. right. Yeah. okay, so how much of this do you want? Because the story behind it, difficult situation with a client, so I've copied and pasted the email from that client, which was testy to say the least. And the prompt <laughs> I put in was I had this email from a client who's not particularly happy with us. We had a project go well over scope and the time allocated, partly due to us, partly due to his demands, that I believe are often unreasonable. How should I succinctly respond? Okay, just stop for a second. So maybe I've made you go too fast. Everyone, everyone, so just maybe say the table as well. But what table group are you uh, on? Table one. But what is that? The sales? Oh, I'm sorry. What is it? That's sorry. people HR and training. People HR and training. Yes, yeah, so it's dispute resolution. And so you had a dispute resolution. They sent You sent an email which didn't go down well with the other party. So the dispute, dispute escalated. Yeah. And then what was the prompt again? Uh, I had this email from a client. Right. Do you, do you, are you going to type this in? Or you... I'm not going to do all of it. That just uh, won't take too long. But you just say it's all. I had this email from a client who was not happy with us. We had a project go well over scope and time allocated, partly due to us and partly due to his demands that I believe are often unreasonable. How should I succinctly respond? This is the email. So we go along and then pasted the email in. And you did this after you sent your own email. Oh god, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. years, course, months later. Chat GBT did an awesome job. I did a terrible job. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. So thank you for that. So that's, that's um, how about that for as an example for people HR? Difficult email. You just wish in hindsight you had chat GPT when you I've used it, not that I had it. I have it, I should have used it. Yeah, you wish you had used it <laughs> to help you work through that moment. Okay. <laughs> Table number two. Who's the person? So we're, uh, we're, we're consulting, advice, strategy, and planning. Hi, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Um, we've got a real mix of um, folk here, ranging from trainers not left the station um, through to a 7 out of 10 in terms of use and tips and so on. So we've, we've shared some really good tips. In terms of prompts, um, we tended to stay, possibly because of my bias, I, learned, I, I hit it that way straight away, we stayed in the client space. So using it to pose as the client um, and throwing questions such as what is, you know, you are client X, what is nobody doing well for you? Mm -hmm. um, you are client X, one of my favorite questions to a client. Um, you are client X, what are your pain points? Um, and so on. So we thought it was a really nice way to get into the skin and get it playing out all of that and do that, that um, client insights for us. Uh, there was one that was just coming up towards the end, we are talking about, um, um, make, potentially exploring archetypes with this type of person, which is just a, maybe a pithy way of diving into specific pain points and preoccupations. Excellent. Any other additional things, folk? Okay, table three. Okay, so we've got the table of sales, tenders, proposals, customer service, and pitch practice. I'm Rebecca Tucker, and we're the sales expert on the panel. 
So we go into the conversation of AI, and these are the two things that we came to. One scenario was membership organisation um, may have got a product which is a health and safety software product. You see it over here, so I haven't got my back to you guys. And um, what they what they need to do was actually then target another market segment. So the prompt was following the prompts was first of all the description of the health and safety safety software. Then we said act as a sales expert, tailor a sales campaign, um, sales pitch to the electrical contractor. So to the electrical contractor in the construction industry. So it was like what it was at first, the description, then who we are to be, and then who we're targeting. That was what we came up with. The second one was marketing agency tender, and we were tendering to a website. So we've been asked to put in a tender response to do a website. So that one we said, as a tender response expert, so the, the person we thought would say was a tender response expert, for a marketing company, responding to a tender about building a website, respond to these questions and then put the list of questions. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, table four. Hi everyone, Kajal, Kajal Pala from MindFlight7. So we had uh, aviation, virtual reality insurance, university and catering industries presented um, on our table. Very interesting discussion. So a couple of things, uh, policies and procedures was our key focus. Um, and operation efficiency and safety uh, documentation uh, from the industry, insurance industry, like uh, forming some of the contracts using ChatGPT and AI technology that are standard uh, templated. Uh, that was one of the key things uh, that we discovered. Uh, some of the most common IT issues uh, that often uh, happens that has templated answer um, and also enhancing that knowledge globally uh, using that AI technology was one of the key findings that we had. Uh, I come from uh, virtual reality industry, education technology, we work with over 200 schools and one of the key points that I personally, we are using JetGPT up to a certain extent uh, and what we're seeing is the student engagement and the retention is um, really next level for the students who have visual impairment, they come with disability or some um, students with specific conditions and on spectrum. Um, often the technology is not widely inclusive for those students. With uh, usage of this particular technology, we are currently working on making it happen for everyone. So, uh, there Wait, is a- Do you have a prompt? Um, Otherwise, yeah, we, we talked in general about prompts, but we didn't actually. But in particular, for yours then, right, what's a prompt that will give you that, that great educational outcome? So, um, there's a, a, so, so there, there are some common issues, for example, if you're performing open heart surgery in VR. Um, I prompt, have that problem all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the prompt is, how do you dissect the heart? Um, and that comes from the actual, uh, and the students are actually performing this. So that's what you put into chat GPT? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I didn't even know at that time when the educator presented that to me, and I was like, what did he But he actually gained some real world knowledge from the students if this was the right kind of procedure. Um, and that was very globalized. So um, we have got some educators already using it. Okay, They're right. teaching us how it's so useful in the student engagement and retention aspect. But of, of course, they are every industry presented here. Um, cool. Great benefits. Okay. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Um, five. Come on, guys. <laughs> Everyone else has stepped back. <laughs> 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 Which is the prompt, sorry? Uh, what's your prompt? <laughs> <laughs> what's your prompt? You're starting to feel like a puppet? So, well, in terms of the first question, how far down the journey am I? It's about how, how many minutes have we been in the talk? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're an expert then. Yeah, I am. So, uh, so uh, my name's Cameron. I'm from the Myers Briggs company, and we're looking at marketing creation. Uh, we've had a bit of a chat. Uh, we started to talk about the idea of just writing a blog or some marketing content. Uh, and, yeah, kind of had the idea of uh, writing a blog in the area of like, leadership development uh, in the post-pandemic landscape. So 
we just started writing. So you're a marketing expert uh, in the field of leadership development. Uh, write a blog post from the perspective of the Maya Freaks company. That was my idea. Um, uh, this post should be 100 words long. Uh, tone of voice should be approachable, informative, semi-corporate. Yes. Uh, I've done really well in these last few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, little bit of system here. Uh, this should discuss the social landscape in a post-COVID environment. Uh, reference articles from Harvard Business Review. Uh, keywords. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hybrid communication, decision making, employee engagement, uh, avoid poor copy, avoid inaccuracies, provide step by step reasoning as to why you've written what you've written. And <laughs> this is what it came up with. Mark's already done it. Very good, you proved it. I've looked at it, it's, it's not, not perfect, which means we have to. trying to get it exactly right and would have ended up with 94, 70% of what you've ended up with doing it the way you did it. So to me, the big take out of that is that there are so many applications everywhere that, that you know, are just below the surface and that our old habits maybe prevent us from really clearly seeing. So that was real. And the fact that you said that it did a great job, you sort of thought, well, you know, it takes the emotion out of it, it comes back to something, even if you look at it and go, I can do a little bit better, you're changing a word here or there. The amount of time and energy and emotional kind of involvement that would have saved, I thought was fantastic. So that's a really interesting usage case from my point of view. Um, so I know it was rushed, but out of 110, put your hand up really high if it was 10 and down low if it's one. Was that useful? Just doing that, did it help anything? Okay, well, great. Oh, my goodness, 20 minutes, look how much we achieved. So hopefully you can take these things across. Um, because of time, we do have to finish at 4.30, right? Well, 25. We've done so well, we can finish at 4.30. 25. All right, so... Hang on, I'll just put it in the chat to you. Yeah, yeah, see you in the chat to you later, right? So, Mike, I... So hopefully you guys can talk and give us feedback afterwards. Um, but my two cents worth, uh, my, my journey on this, I've transitioned from using it from, uh, yes, it still helps me um, to express what I want to say, but I think the power of these technologies is to help me understand other people better mm. and to give that back to me. Mm. And so for me, table two, you are a client, what is your pain point mm. is like the highlight. It's a little bit... Like, if you had the angry email, if you said, you know, what do you, well, why do you think, tell me why they're so upset, right? Yeah. And you start hearing back, chat GPT acts like a filter for you to summarize what other people, like the tender, like it'd be great to do the tender response, but now you kind of want to step into the shoes of the person evaluating the tender. So yeah. imagine that you are the person who wrote this tender, yeah. Uh, what is the, What is your core problem? Why did you write this document in the first place? What's the core problems? And you get your feedback on that. Um, policy procedures, not, not so much, but you could say why they bloody hell did my business write this procedure? <laughs> but, um, you know, but it might help, be helpful for you to understand, look, I know this is a pain in the backside of the procedure, but it's going to keep you safe. It, you know, it's, going, it's meant to make consistency of the business yeah. or Also, whatever. translating from legalese into generally yeah. accepted right. stuff. So we've talked about the case of an insurance policy that's very complex and legalistic. Well, if I'm trying to explain that to a client in a summary form, I can spend half a day trying to break it down or I can get chat with GPT to do it. Yes. So yes. pretend you are a 20 year old, how, how is this, uh, how do you make this understandable? So, so that's my suggestion. The other thing I would say is to use that is with all these lines, obviously what, what I was encouraging to do is, is don't take the response, the first response back as okay, experiment for the next whatever time to try and do two or three prompts. Um, start developing in your repertoire some um, links 
like greatly you're saying your reference, like this is the this is the content, this is the website of the customer I'm trying to be in business from. Read that and help me. This is the whatever, now look at this and come back to me. So start feeding more and more of these decisions and um, you get even more useful responses. So I just want to wrap up the group discussion on that because that's the feedback from the group. Uh, we, I'm not going to go into it, but we have we, then we do want to acknowledge some risks. So, but I think we have no time for that. So the risks. <laughs> so we have time. We have time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Five minutes. We've got five so, risks. So yes, risk. There, yes, true. There is a risk of trust. Can you trust what it says? Especially the more it becomes convincing. So it, it, it has, the, the term is a hallucination. Michael referred to it. Do you want to say anything more about that? Um, no, just, just that the more I think about this, you don't really trust everything that you're given in the first draft anyway. So if you consider everything coming out of this system as a first draft, then you are going to look at it uh, critically. And that's the way it should be until such time as it evolves to a point where you don't have to do that anymore, which is probably six to eight weeks. My two cents, <laughs> two cents worth is think of it as a human, not a computer. How much do you really trust all the humans to advise that they give you? Um, so. But there's ways that you can have these review and modification systems. I gave you examples of how governments can, can reduce the risk of your staff taking it as gospel truths. Um, and so you can talk about these um, systems for governance. The other one is leakage. So leakage is about the issue of that will I lose control over my sensitive information, my IP? Will I all of a sudden, by using my staff, start using my knowledge? Will that start going out into the AI and someone else might do it? Um, do, do you want to say anything about that? Um, no, I think you're the expert. Right. The answer is, uh, if, if you use natively, well, the answer is, you, if all these people say no, it's just whether you trust them, right? So again, it comes down to whether you trust the company who's built the AI system. Um, for example, Microsoft, very, very clearly states that if you use their AI system, it's architect to protect the, the tenant, the group, the individual data, and they've got a whole bunch, of, they, they say we can do this, and that, they're basically trying to win business, right? They want you to use their portal to access open AI, and they guarantee that all your private AI will never go past that gate into, it won't aid the learning model, in other words. So the governance, it's, it's about like, how do you trust a vendor or a supplier of yours? Yeah. It's not going to steal your IP. At the end of the day, it's legal. At the end of the day, it's around governance controls. There's still a place for all of that. And, and I argue also that it applies equally to everybody in your industry anyway. So if it happens to one, it will happen to all, and it just represents a change in the way business takes place. So you know, the best case scenario is that everyone adapts and policies and you know ways of doing things come into play that uh, minimise the, the risks associated with it. But if it makes everybody more efficient, then that's good for the so, so Microsoft, there's a you know YouTube video where they've got two employees, one who's a manager and knows about a new an office move that's happening, and a, and a staff that has no idea because they're not part of the project, and they both ask the same question, and the manager gets answers about oh yes the project's happening, it's on time, you're going to do blah blah blah, and the, the user says there's no plans for an office move, you know, and so um, the way that goes. So cyber threats is obviously a big part of my domain. Um, so even though we've been hit by cyber ransomware and it's been made easier, there's still like a barrier to entry to be a really good at ransomware yeah. because you have to be good at software programming. <laughs> Just, so unfortunately that barrier to entry has almost disappeared. So dumb criminals, the bikey gang, can hack a big, a big business and do it. And, they, and so this automation can happen. So uh, you no longer need to be a, no longer need to be a skilled criminal with software coding skills. So um, the, uh, the criminals, this came out in a, a financial review. So they, you just can't trust, you can't trust a human to be able to detect that uh, something's a scam, basically. It's so convincing. And, and so they, they get into your network by tricking someone very convincingly. Once they're in your network, they can evade you by writing a whole lot of software and so on. So. Um, and the other one, the other risk you're facing is competitors. Uh, not only the competitors you know really well, but there's a really great opportunity with AI for uh, disruptive competitors. So someone who has no right to be in your 
that's good to spin money can enter that market. Um, and like, for example, um, law. Someone could come in on law, provide legal advice, who have never, you know, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't know if that would happen, but I'm just trying to come up with an example of unexpected competitors are, are going to come in. And so the issue, can you afford not to do it? And this is a slide I showed from you know, April, uh, sorry, November last year again. Like, already, just before ChatGPT, 65% of people's workers were using some sort of automation, and they had plans already. What we know from the big end of town is that billions of dollars have been unlocked. Every hedge fund is throwing money, like, that, you know, it's unbelievable the amount of money that's going into this thing from everywhere. Um, and everyone's using it, so it's, it's a massive thing. And then the finally, employee disengage, disengagement will become an issue for you um, that you need to be proactive about. Um, it, I, point, I think of it as similar to back in the day, there was a real pushback on colour monitors. Like, no one could see the business value in going to colour monitors. Like, can't you do your job in black and white? Um, and so that was the big debate. And uh, am I showing my age? And, um, and, and so obviously no one would work in a business that gave them black and white monitors. Mm. And I also know doctors that if they don't have the internet, they will not go to the clinic. If they can't use Dr. Google, the doctors will not turn up. So um, they want the internet. So ChatGPT is the fastest growing app ever. The staff are probably using it. They're probably putting your corporate data into ChatGPT <coughs> now, um, and so you need to figure out what you want to do about it. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Wendy wants to ask a very quick question. So, so I just want to go down kind of the ethics part, um, and... Wrong word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, no. like, it's self educational, like it educates itself and it's going, it's going to get more smarter and it's more smarter. Are we going down the Skynet route or what's the ethical kind of parameters? I had 45 minute presentation that okay. was cut out of this okay. <laughs> about what is under the hood, Okay. what is the G, what is the P, what is the T, oh, okay. and people told me to cut it. Oh. Uh, so you, it's a, it's I'm glad we did because we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Maybe you, 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 you're, next you're, and you're aware, of, if you're concerned about AI safety, and if you're not, your employees will, mm. you're just going to have to make time with me. I'll talk through with you. Brilliant. Anything Brilliant. else? Other than to say valid concern. It's valid. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and truly, I know your presentation for another time. It's really, really interesting. Thank you so much to uh, Greg Clarkson and Dr. Michael Rowe for your insightful uh, presentation. Really enjoyed that. <laughs> Present, the members and experts obviously be able to access almost through the resource centre. For those of you uh, guests in attendance, um, let us know. Happy to give you a copy of that presentation. So that's all good.